Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Cody Firearms Museum, part of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And I'm taking a look at some of the guns in their fantastic reference collection. Today what we have to take a look at is the Colt model of 1929 semi-automatic rifle. Now this was one of the entrants into the US uh, military search for a self-loading rifle throughout the 1920s. This is the program that would eventually adopt the M1 Garand as the official US Army service rifle. But along the way, a whole bunch of other inventors proposed and submitted designs uh, for this project. Now, like pretty much all of the rifles that were seriously submitted for this test, this one is in 276 caliber. Uh, that was the preferred caliber for most of the testing until they finally decided for logistical reasons to switch back to 30 6 And this rifle was designed by Jonathan Edward Browning. Uh, he is, some you'll see him referred to as Jonathan Browning. Um, I believe he actually, in his own life, he tended to go by the name Ed. Um, he was called Ed Browning. And he was John uh, Moses Browning's half-brother. So he was a firearms designer. He definitely had some talent, not quite as much as his half-brother, John Moses. Uh, but he was able to uh, make a good business using the family name. Uh, and in large part, when other people might not be able to get something closely looked at, Jonathan Ed Browning could because that name Browning. At any rate, he submitted this uh, in cooperation with the Colt company. He designed it, Colt manufactured it, and it actually it didn't do very well in trials. Um, the US government had a couple issues with it. First off, it wasn't sufficiently reliable. It broke a couple of parts in testing, and they didn't like how long the receiver was. They thought that was too bulky, too long. Um, and it has an interesting short recoil tilting bolt mechanism with an accelerator in it, which is kind of reminiscent of uh, John Moses Browning's model of 1919 machine gun, which is pretty cool. Uh, it does have a detachable 10 round box magazine, which is neat. And um, well, enough of the chat. Let's take a closer look at this. Let's take this apart and see how it actually works inside. And I think you'll see part of why they didn't uh, take this a whole lot farther in testing. So this was tested in 1930 by the U.S. Ordnance Board along with five other guns. Uh, the others were a uh, toggle-locked rifle designed by Carl Heinemann. The, uh, the three that would eventually, well, that would come out of these trials and, and be recommended for further study, which were the White Rifle, the Pedersen Rifle, and the Garand Rifle, and then also the Colt, and the uh, Czech ZH-29 was tested. So like I said, ultimately, uh, a bunch of problems were found with this rifle. They didn't like how long the receiver was. As a result, they didn't like the fact that the barrel was too short, although it's not really a particularly short barrel. Um, it was nine pounds, nine ounces, which wasn't, was actually relatively light uh, for this trial, but um, had a number of broken parts and uh, a number of reliability problems. So, oh, and had they deemed too many parts in total. Now the field stripping is pretty simple. But the detail stripping is a nightmare, as you can see from this fully detail stripped uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground photo from the period. No. So a recoil operating firearm uh, is one where the recoil energy of the bullet and the gas is going forward is used to push the entire barrel assembly backwards. You can see I can push the barrel all the way back into its shroud here. Uh, this recoils about three quarters of an inch, which would be 18 millimeters or so. Uh, when that happens, the bolt moves backwards as well, and the bolt and the barrel stay locked together for a short period of time here. Now the, the locking mechanism in this particular rifle is a tilting bolt, actually kind of like, well the best example that comes to mind is the FAL. However, you can't really see it because it also has this sheet metal dust cover that protects the, uh, the, op the ejection port opening here. So when I do this, the bolt is tilting, but this dust cover remains in place and prevents you from seeing it. So what we will have to do is take this apart in order to see what's going on in there. All right, a couple quick things before we take it apart. First off, the markings on the top of the receiver. Colt semi-automatic rifle, caliber 276, model of 1929, and of course tested in 1930. We have a safety catch back here. Uh, the forward position is safe, S. The rearward position is fire, F. Our magazine release is this button in the trigger guard. Push that in and the magazine comes out. We'll take this out for disassembly anyway. So, 10 rounds. Uh, unlike later testing, these did not use an end block clip. 
And the rear sight is also kind of an interesting thing. There's an aperture here, which interestingly has actually not been drilled. I can't get a good camera angle on that, but there's a, a spot hole or a spot uh, divot for a, an aperture hole, but no actual hole through the sight and no markings on the sight either. But what you do to adjust it is actually push forward on this assembly and then you can lever it up or down and these little teeth lock into place for your different sight adjustments. I also need to have that up to disassemble it, so we'll leave it there. Now, speaking of disassembly, we will start with this pin. It needs to come lifted up about 90 degrees and then the pin comes out. There we go. Originally, you probably would have used something like a cartridge rim on this little lip, but I'm not going to be the guy to scratch the gun up by doing that. So, uh, lift this pin up, roughly vertical. There we go. Pin comes out. Now, the rear cover is going to lift up and out of the rifle. There we go. Now, actually, here's the next trick. This is a little bit wonky. Again, this would be easier if you weren't concerned about scratching the insides a little bit. But we have this long tail on the bolt itself, and that connects to this plunger, which is the recoil spring. So the spring itself is located down inside the stock, and then this plunger allows it to act on the bolt. You can see how that goes back and forth like so. Now at this point, you can actually also see the bolt lifting up right there, out of battery, and dropping down into battery when it locks. So in order to take this apart, I just need to push that plunger forward slightly, and then I can take the recoil spring out. This, you can't see it on camera, but the easiest way to do this is to hold it upside down so that the, the tail there just falls out when I have the plunger pushed in. There we go. All right, now the whole bolt assembly can just slide out the back of the receiver like so. Now, here's one of the cool bits. There's an accelerator in here. What the heck is an accelerator, you say? Well, what this does, you can see we have here this frame on the inside of the gun. That is uh, the barrel shroud. So the, this is physically attached to the barrel. In fact, you can see the end of the chamber right there just starting to poke forward. This is the bit that recoils back and forth. So that's the full travel of recoil when you fire. So if we look at the position of the top of this accelerator right here, it's going to travel from about half an inch in front of this frame to at the end of recoil, now it's about a quarter inch behind this. So whatever this is attached to is actually traveling farther than this is in the same period of time because they're mechanically linked together, which means that this, which is by the way pushing on the bolt assembly, this forces the bolt to speed up and go faster than the barrel assembly. Now a couple other bits that we can see inside here. This little hook is connected to the trigger. Uh, so when you pull down, that's going to release the firing pin. We'll take a look at where that connects to the bolt in just a moment. And in addition, the safety is this hook, which by the way comes out like that. And when this is on safe, it pulls back here, and so that hook goes into this slot, and I believe it's going to grab that bar, move it, and block the trigger. Because when that hook is in place, the, uh, when the safety's on, the trigger's disconnected and the bolt cannot retract. So. so we can't really see it because all the furniture is still on this rifle, although you can get little glimpses through the vent holes there. Uh, but what's interesting is the barrel shroud on this actually has a whole bunch of big perforations. You can see that on Aberdeen's uh, f detailed stripped picture. That was, the theory was to uh, improve cooling. Those holes in conjunction with these holes in the furniture uh, and also on the bottom. But uh, it didn't work well enough. That was another one of the complaints that the Ordnance Department had was that this was an insufficiently cooled rifle. So. Okay, let's take a closer look at the bolt. Obviously we have the tail here. It pivots both because as the bolt is traveling in this plane, the recoil spring is traveling in this plane, and so the tail has to be able to pivot, but also allowing it to come up to disassemble the gun. We have our dust cover here, 
which has a little pin on the front, which goes into that hole, and that allows the dust cover to sit here and basically block off this section, prevent dirt from getting in there while you're shooting. The actual locking surface of the gun is right here. That locks up against this surface in the barrel assembly. So once again, this accelerator, which actually is performing two functions, I realize now, um, the bolt right here is locked into this surface right there in the barrel assembly. The two recoil together because that's how the recoil system works. And now there's another thing going on there at the same time, and that is these pair of arms are also being pushed back. The firing pin is this center piece right here. It's also this piece, it's long, and you can see there's a little hook right there. That hook engages with the hook right there, which is the trigger, so that when the trigger pulls that one down, this is pulled down, which releases the firing pin to snap forward. I don't know how strong that spring is, so I'm not gonna mess with it. What would then happen is uh, these hooks would be pushed all the way back, and when the gun cycles, they're going to, as the bolt goes backward, these hooks are going to be pushed out like this, which are going to, it's going to force the firing pin back and recock it. The bolt face, of course, has the normal components. We've got an extractor on the right and a slot for the ejector on the left. And you can actually see the ejector right there. That's, that's a pretty typical piece. So that is how the Colt model of 1929 by Ed Browning actually functions. So I've taken the dust cover off and I've got the top cover off and I don't have the recoil spring hooked up. So we can get a really good idea for exactly how this actually functioned. So when I push on the barrel, you can see what happens first is the barrel and the bolt are locked together. So they're gonna push backwards and the bottom end of the bolt actually rides up on a pair of tracks back here, just like that. That is what unlocks the bolt. So you can see our locking surface right here is now coming out of engagement. It's no longer physically blocked by the barrel assembly, which means it can come out. When that happens, now we've got the accelerator, which starts to have an impact. So right there, you can see the accelerator is just starting to contact uh, the, the inside of the bolt. and it's going to push the bolt back farther than the barrel assembly goes, speeding it up so that the, re the inertia uh, on its own momentum, it will continue backward, fully cycle, charge a, you know, pick up a new cartridge, and it's, well, extract the, bleh, eject the old cartridge, and then the recoil spring here will push it back forward, pick up a new, new cartridge and chamber it. When that happens, the tail of the bolt rides back down that surface, which is going to re-engage the locking lug right there, fully into battery. So you can see there's a little bit, there's just a very short period here where the whole thing moves backward without rising. That is the time delay required for the chamber, the bullet to leave the bore and the chamber pressure to drop to a safe level before, right there, the bolt unlocks and starts to pull the empty case out. Well, thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, definitely, there, there aren't many of these left, certainly single digits, maybe only just this one. Uh, so very cool to be able to take it apart and see how it actually works internally. Uh, if you are ever in the Cody area, I would strongly recommend stopping by the Cody Firearms Museum to check out their collection. This is one of the rifles that uh, is always up on display along with about 4,000 others. So definitely worth your time. And if you like content like this, please consider subscribing to my Patreon account. It is funds from that that uh, are the main way that I am able to travel to places like Wyoming and bring guns like this to you guys. Thanks for watching.